people of Haiti. But is all that aid getting to those who need it most? To find out, the CBC recently sent a team of reporters to Haiti, and they discovered that although some progress is being made, life for many Haitians is still a desperate struggle. Here's the CBC's Paul Hunter. On its surface, Port-au-Prince is looking a little tidier. Rubble is dumping its way into trucks, and gangs of street cleaners are working hard, it seems, at every corner. But dig a little deeper and you'll find misery everywhere else. At this tent city, this woman, hurt so badly by the quake she can barely stand up, tells us no foreign aid has come her way. She sleeps on cardboard, folded for extra comfort. Around the corner, this woman's world is now a tiny 100% cotton cube. That's it? C'est ça? Lots is being donated, she tells us, but I've got nothing. It's a refrain heard more and more among the hundreds of thousands of freshly homeless here. Where is it? Is there Canadian aid here? Is there Cana are there Canadian tents here? Of course. Vancouver's John McEwen, second in command at this tent city, told us it's better than it was, but barely. 17,000 people live here in squalor, urine and feces everywhere. And the rainy season is about to begin. These do not look like tents, to be fair, that would sustain a rainfall either. Would you want to be in one? McEwen unloaded a container of Canadian donations this week, including rainproof tents, but only after being held up by Haitian bureaucrats for 17 days. If he seems angry, it's because... I am! <laughs> and consider these water purifiers, distributed by Toronto aid worker Karam Nazir. People are so desperate for them, he does this only with security guards, otherwise he'd be swarmed. I've never felt unsafe in a camp, but right outside a camp with a truck full of boxes, I get nervous. So stacks more sit undelivered. So other Haitians have taken to helping one another. At this gravel pit outside the city, they're handing out what few toys, clothes and foods they can gather themselves because foreign aid isn't making it here either. The proof of that is in the lineup outside, she says. And Peter, I should underline, Haitians are extremely grateful for the donations that have made it here, including from Canadians. You see Canadian tents throughout Port-au-Prince. The problem is still just getting them to where they're needed most. And again, that overarching problem that the scale of the disaster is just so enormous. The CBC reporters also discovered that although the Canadian government had pledged $200 million in matching donations, none of that money had yet been spent, and at least one aid organization was going home. Sasha Petrasek has that story. Excuse me, excuse me. The first time Raoul Singh walked through this hospital, the dead and dying were crying out for help. It's easy to lift. Yeah, A Toronto paramedic, he took unpaid leave and headed for Haiti the moment the earthquake hit. The second we got into Haiti, we installed portable water purification systems right into this hospital so all the patients could get water. The two portable units are still pumping out clean drinking water today, just like the 60 others he brought. So far, a total of 10 million litres. Singh runs a modest Canadian NGO called Global Medic. Some of its water systems are suitcase size, distributed around Port-au-Prince daily on the back of motorcycles. Others are more permanent. Every one is funded by private donations. Last month, when that money started to run out, he applied to CETA for a small grant. Uh, three projects have been refused. Uh, we don't know where the fourth one is, but you know, we submitted six weeks ago for that fourth project, so I would imagine it's not going to get accepted. So, you're done? We're done. The money would have come from a fund Ottawa set up to match Canadians' donations to Haiti since the earthquake, one that's reached $200 million. So far, not a single penny of that has been spent, not a single project has been approved, not even in other critical areas such as shelter. This is why we have to find a better way to take care of these people. It's I meet up with Canada's ambassador to Haiti at a tent night. camp nearby. Ottawa has provided some money to Haiti through another, much smaller emergency fund, used, for instance, to build showers here. But Jill Rivard says the $200 million has to wait. It's a work that cannot be done overnight. 
but we're working, I can tell you, uh, uh, seven days a week to find a solution to the problem. You look at this particular emergency. We said very on, early on, the first couple of days, Canadian aid is on the way. Peter, Global Medic is the only Canadian organization that's been so outspoken in its criticism of Ottawa. But I have to tell you, I've talked to quite a few Canadian aid workers here in Haiti, and many of them share Raoul Singh's frustrations. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem is that many Haitians fled the capital city of Port-au-Prince to take refuge in the countryside, and many rural communities had to find a way to feed them and house them, often without much international help. This man is providing refuge to 16 of his friends and relatives. No. There's no food, he says, nothing at all. No, 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 no. Another big problem is security, which is preventing aid from getting to where it's needed. Here again is the CBC's Sasha Petrasik. To drive into this corner of Port-au-Prince is to run a gauntlet of misery. Even with shelter, it's a wretched place to live. And for more than two months now, tens of thousands here have been without a roof. On this day, I follow the aid organization MSF, Doctors Without Borders, as it turns its focus to shelter, bringing in a hundred tents. I'm barely out of the car, still setting up my camera, when the project leader delivers her warning. Watch out for the armed gangs. I just ask you, if you say we, we have to go, uh, don't discuss and go, it means that there is big security issue. Because those guys are not controllable at the moment at all. Yesterday, there were threats against anyone who dared do this. Today, volunteer guards from the community hover nervously in their orange vests. As the teams put up the tents, there has been one issue that all of the aid organizations have had to deal with, security, especially here in this Cité Soleil, one of the worst areas of the city before the earthquake, one of the most violent. It's been a real balance, how to put up tents to provide places to live for people who still don't have them, but how to do it safely. The international aid community is nervous too, nervous to deliver shelter to such a place and so slow to respond. We have to go step by step and we couldn't go, <laughs> couldn't be quicker than that. Project leader, Carole Coeur. The issue for us is we are not enough people doing that, especially in this area, Cité Soleil, because it's pretty known to be a, a touchy area. So at the moment, we are a bit alone on the spot. You have more power if you make like this. And yet, they're actually not alone. Just about everyone here is a local volunteer, eagerly helping put up tents for his or her own community. Romula Silicia says he's tired of living under leaky plastic sheets and proud to be building something better, even if two families will be crowded into each tent. Sure, says Petit Capobiti, it was frustrating to wait, but we were hopeful, and see, someone finally came. Besides, Guillaume Renault points out, no one was obliged to help us, it's a gift, so it's welcome whenever it arrives, whenever and no matter who brings it. What's interesting here is how much emphasis Doctors Without Borders, an organization known for its emergency medicine, is putting on shelter. Patients who learn how to walk again. Of course, they're also running hospitals, like this one, specializing in fractured limbs and amputations, a hospital run by Martin Flokstra. You look here and you think like, uh, hey, this is like a little oasis. She <laughs> worries that all this care will be for nothing if patients don't have a place to, to live to when they leave. Point. If you look around, uh, if you speak of dignity in life, uh, it's far to be found, eh? and yes, 60% 60 60 uh, uh, of the population who lost their house uh, uh, have now shelter, but it's, this still means that 500,000 people at this moment are without shelter. They are living under bed sheets on the street, which is uh, terrible, yeah. I catch up with Canadian psychologist Dr. Nicole Obey, also with MSF, helping out with patients' mental health. She's been analyzing Haiti. This is a broken city. This is a broken country. Um, they, they are 
uh, exhausted emotionally when they think about their future. They feel abandoned by their own. They're really thankful that we, the outside world, are here and they fear that a lot of NGO has already started to leave and they fear that they will remain alone and, and abandoned. Two days later, I visit that batch of tents at Cité Soleil. They're all up, but they're sitting empty, enviously eyed by everyone. A local community worker stands guard. He says it breaks his heart to keep families out, but the community has decided. Until there are enough tents for everyone in this little corner of Port-au-Prince, no one gets one. And of course, these days, there are never enough. Sasha Petrusek, CBC News, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Despite the grim situation, our reporters did find at least one story to smile about. The story of a Canadian who saw a CBC report about a desperate situation at a medical clinic and decided to take matters into his own hands. Here again is the CBC's Paul Hunter. Even 11 weeks later, the quake wounds linger. What's different at this medical clinic near the Port-au-Prince airport is doctors now have what it takes to do it right. Hardly the case in the days right after the earthquake. Who can forget these images? The place had run out of anesthetic, even though just meters away, medical donations were stacked high at the airport, but paralyzed by bureaucracy. But after seeing that CBC report, a mercy mission was organized by the boss of Air Canada, Duncan D who sent literally tons of aid specifically for that clinic from Canadians. Canadian, um, all of this medication. Really? Canadian, yep, yeah, all of it. John Bopp, a volunteer from Boston, was here then and, and then now. And in pointing out this generator, those smocks, note the logo, and these yeah, medicines. Canada, most of the stuff still has the flags on it. He gives credit and thanks to Canadians, not least because it's all still helping those in need. So they're still coming every day? Every day, yeah. We're seeing uh, in this whole place about 500 patients a day. This is 10, 11 weeks later. Yes, yeah, it's still very bad. But back in the day, treatment here meant time in a wheelbarrow for this poor girl. Now, patients are in comfy hospital chairs. Check the sticker. And remember the spot where those children shrieked in agony? It's now part of a gynecological clinic. The place quickly became the envy of other clinics. So people would say, yeah, hey, where did you get these chairs? Where did you get this stuff? Where did you get these boxes of children's Tylenol? And what did you say? Air Canada came down. It's clear this place touched the hearts of Canadians. These best wishes taped to a clinic door are from Ottawa school children. There's also little doubt none of it would be here if Air Canada hadn't raised and brought the supplies itself. I think that that's what it's all about. I think if people know that their stuff is actually getting to people and making a difference, I think that there's, there will be so many more donations. So much suffering, so many people trying to help, so much work still to be done. And that's News and Review. Don't forget to check out our website at newsandreview.cbclearning.ca. I'm Carla Robinson. Thanks for watching. Is racism a problem in Canada? I think it's like every other country. In pockets, you'll find racism. But I think we've come a long way. But have we? If I was white, we wouldn't put a cross on that lawn. We wouldn't holler out, die, 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 near your die. On News & Review today, how tolerant are Canadians? Hello, I'm Carla Robinson. Canada is a multicultural country, a country of many races and backgrounds. The country's Charter of Rights and Freedoms bans discrimination on the grounds of race and other criteria. And most of us like to think of our country as a welcoming and tolerant one. 
but how tolerant are we? A recent poll commissioned by CBC News showed that many Canadians believe that discrimination is still pervasive in Canada. And a recent incident in Nova Scotia brought back memories of a dark time. The CBC's Red Sharon has that story. Hans County, Nova Scotia, February 21st, 2010. Plays over every day. Yeah. Just fear. You know, everything we went through that night. It's been almost a month, but Michelle Lyon and Shane Howe are still badly shaken. It was 1.30 in the morning. They had just returned from a cousin's birthday party. My oldest daughter, she was still awake. She was like, Mom, Mom. And uh, she's look out the window. I could hear people screaming obscenities and, and racial slurs, and I seen a ball of fire. I thought a car hit the lamppost and burst into flames. But when her partner Shane rushed out to the front lawn, he quickly realized this was no accident. And what did you see? I've seen a cross. I had the rope going around it, around the neck, and around the arms, and it was just on fire. He said, call 911, so I called 911. With five children inside, there were more than a few terrified moments until the police arrived. In my mind, I knew what it symbolized at the time, and that's what scared me the most and for my family, because I didn't know what was coming next. Two local men have been charged with a number of offenses, including public incitement of hatred. If I was white, they wouldn't have put a cross on that lawn. They wouldn't holler out, die, 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 near your die. No, they did it because I'm black. Many in the community have come to the couple's support with a rally and dozens of cards and letters encouraging them to stay. Please count us as among your supporters. But that's not all there's been. Some people who live here say this incident had nothing to do with race. They won't appear on camera, but they suggest this was simply a dispute between relatives because Michelle Lyon is distantly related to the accused. But others say what this is, is yet another example of the racial tension that's been running through Nova Scotia for a long time. The complaints are older than the tearing down of Halifax's black